Hi, this is David Simmons, and uh, this is sort of a studio version of a talk I delivered to the Denver Rust Meetup uh, a couple of nights ago about my side project to implement WebRTC data channels in Rust. So let's get started. Uh, first, a little bit about me. I'm a freelance software engineer, um, worked many years in the consumer electronics industry, doing a lot of C, C++, Linux device drivers, audio, video, all that good stuff. I've always been interested in network protocols, uh, you know, which of course leads me to trying to do a project like this. Um, the goal of the uh, project here is to eventually create a full set of WebRTC crates for Rust, where you can just uh, have a dependency in your cargo tunnel on the, uh, the web, this WebRTC crate, and there you go. You can do media channels, data channels, connect with peers, you know, wh whatever. Uh, the short-term goal is just to support data channels, and that involves something called SCTP, the Stream Control Transport Protocol. Uh, I like for this to all be in pure Rust as much as possible. Of course, I'm not going to be rolling my own crypto, so um, for now we'll be using OpenSSL or whatever for that. Uh, this, you know, sort of subject matter could be very uh, heavy on the problem domain. There's a lot we could talk about when it comes to like protocol ossification, why we have to do things the way we do, do them, but we're really just going to scream through a few highlights on this just so we can get to the good Rust bits. So talking about WebRTC, uh, we start with peer-to-peer -peer networking. Uh, what is peer-to-peer -peer networking? That's where my computer connects directly to your computer uh, to communicate. We don't go through a third party. We don't go through Facebook or Google or, or whatever. We can talk directly. Um, why, why would we want to do this? Uh, there's various technical reasons, you know, lower latency, reduced bandwidth costs. Uh, there could be political reasons. You know, uh, you know, some people implement these privacy and uh, Censorship circumvention networks uh, that are based on peer-to-peer -peer connections. Um, you can do sort of novel network applications like uh, distributed hash tables, cryptocurrencies, and so on. If you can make these peer-to-peer -peer connections, most of all, it's about uh, you know all the things we have yet to invent. You know, there, there's probably all kinds of really great network applications that we'll see in the future that could be made on peer-to-peer -peer networking that we could, can't even imagine right now. Uh, one of the things that got me kind of thinking about doing a WebRTC implementation in Rust is uh, I was playing around with this Raspberry Pi security camera, this little homemade thing where I was throwing some code together, you know, take some videos, and I thought, wow, it would be really great if I could just WebRTC into, into this thing. I mean, isn't that the obvious solution for security cameras? You can uh, use WebRTC to speak directly to your security camera from, you know, wherever in the world, watch the live video. Uh, you know, control it. If you have a Piltan Zoom, you can do whatever. Um, but, uh, of course, there wasn't really a Rust solution. There's, of course, there's a C++ refer reference implementation for WebRTC. Uh, but I thought it would be really great if there was a pure Rust solution. So, uh, we have to go back and talk a bit about the challenges of peer-to-peer -peer networking, and really that challenge is NAT traversal. Uh, in, in an ideal world, we want to communicate this way. I send you a message, your computer gets it. You send me a message, my computer gets it. Uh, in the real world, we, we're all behind these NAT routers, you know, uh, either NAT or you know, stateful firewalls or whatever. You know, even if you have IPv6, it's, you're probably still going to have that stateful firewall um, that really keeps inbound connections from, from being made. Um, we, so these, these routers, you know, if you initiate a connection going out, it'll let the corresponding traffic come back in. You ask for a web page, that web page can come back in, for example, but just something coming in without being initiated from the inside usually does not, does not work. So we try to do peer-to-peer -peer networking with uh, NAT traversal routers and, you know, I send you a message, it gets to your router, your router goes, uh, what, what is this? And, you know, throws up its hands, nothing useful happens. Uh, the way we solve this is a trick invented many years ago called uh, the UDP hole punching technique. And how this works is each peer uh, sends a message, a UDP message, to each other at around the same time. And so the routers in between will say, hey, this is a connection that's being initiated from the inside, so I'll add an entry to my NAT table or whatever uh, to allow this. And once this happens, then you can have a, a flow of UDP, UDP packets afterwards using the same port numbers and addresses. Uh, it's really, there's a lot more to it than that, but this is uh, generally how it works. Uh, the bad thing is, well, it's UDP, right? So we're reinventing 
uh, everything on top of UDP. Uh, we have, you know, we don't have the reliability, we don't have order delivery, we don't have congestion control, which is very important. Um, you know, there there is a thing called TCP simultaneous open. It doesn't work very well in practice. It's extremely sensitive to timing issues. It has to be very, very carefully timed. Um, ironically, people say it works better if you're talking to someone on the other side of the world. Uh, if you're talking to someone nearby on the network with very low latency, low ping times, it it's very difficult to to make to make that work. So, people have pretty much kind of thrown out the TCP simultaneous open as being a practical solution. Some people have some luck with it, they say, but for the most part, we're we're back to using UDP. That does mean reinventing the world, like I said, which is kind of what WebRTC is all about. So. Uh, in, in the beginning, everyone was sort of rolling their own uh, UDP hole punching techniques. You know, there's really a lot more than just sending UDP packets. You have to coordinate, you know, figure out your candidate IP addresses and so on. Um, and uh, one of the first really big examples of this we saw was Skype around 2003. They weren't the first to do UDP, UDP hole punching, but uh, they were a really big one. They kind of turned heads. People were like, hey, how are they doing this? They're communicating directly and everyone's behind the net. How, how does this work? So that uh, was one of the really the first really big prominent examples of UDP hole punching. Um, because everyone was reinventing the wheel here, uh, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, decided to uh, go ahead and set some standards so that we don't really have to reinvent the wheel. So they invented these uh, building blocks, uh, STUN, TURN, and ICE, uh, to help um, standardize the way we do NAT traversal. So yeah, NAT traversal, it's, uh, it's a kludge, but at least now it's a standardized kludge. Uh, so enter WebRTC. Uh, WebRTC is interesting in that it's sort of this two-part uh, system where one half of it is standardized by the World Wide Web Consortium, and this is uh, the part most people are familiar with. This is where, you know, in your JavaScript, you get this API where you can um, open uh, media channels on your, you know, the web browser. You can say, hey, I need access to the microphone. I need access to the camera. Uh, I'd like to send this media to my peer over here, and it takes care of all that for you. There's a whole other half of WebR WebRTC that's standardized by the Internet Engineering Task Force, and that deals with the, the protocol specifications and the networking and so on. They're really the under the hood stuff. Uh, as a systems programmer, when I look at WebRTC, I'm mostly looking at the IETF part. Uh, what's really happening under, under the hood? Uh, and like many things that start with the word web, like WebAssembly, WebDAV, maybe WebSockets, who knows? Uh, WebRTC has ambitions beyond just web browsers. You should be able to use WebRTC in an app, on a consumer electronics device, in a security camera, who, you know, whatever. Um, so let's, uh, oh right, so the, the, you know, we're back to reinventing the world on top of UDP. Uh, so the WebRTC people uh, had to come up with a solution to this. We, they, they said we need to provide reliable delivery, we need to provide congestion control. Um, one way to, to do this would be to layer TCP on top of UDP. Uh, but they said, well, while we're at it, let's, let's just ditch TCP and go with this somewhat newer protocol called SETP. Uh, and use that as a, as a better TCP. So unfortunately, it's still quite complicated. You want to implement WebRTC data channels. Uh, yeah, just for the data channel part of WebRTC, it's well over 800 pages of documents that you have to sift through. But, uh, you know, what are you going to do? This is what the WebRTC protocol stack looks like. Uh, you know, it's... I captioned this, yeah, it's as uh, simple as this, but that's uh, really a bit of sarcasm. You know, once you get a UDP socket from your network, all you need is I stun, turn, datagram TLS, SRTP, SETP, uh, the WebRTC data channel protocol, the glue that hold, binds all these pieces together, and quite a, quite a bit of luck. So the part I'm focused on is SCTP. Uh, I looked at the stack. This looked like it was the hardest, uh, you know, going to be the hardest part of the WebRTC stack, and I thought, Maybe if I pick the hardest part, I could get a crate out before anybody else. If I pick stun or something, of course, you know, as soon as I'm ready to publish it, someone else will. Uh, so I don't know if that was uh, really the best idea or not, but here we are. So what, what, what is SETP? Um, it's a transport layer protocol. It's like TCP or UDP. Uh, it was originally meant to be layered on top of IP, just like TCP and UDP. Uh, unfortunately, due to protocol ossification, it never really took off as being a first-class citizen of the internet. Um, so, in uh, it was invented by the telecommunications industry around 2000 or so. Uh, so, whenever you make a call on your LTE phone, 
you know, uh, there's, uh, you know, you're actually using SCTP. Uh, SCTP is uh, performing the signaling to, to place the call. Um, SCTP is more flexible than TCP. Um, you can configure reliability. You can have fully reliable channels, you know, with retran full retransmissions and acknowledgements and so on. You can have no reliability. Uh, you know, if when for applications that work better that way, uh, or you can have partial reliability. Uh, you can figure whether you want ordered or unordered delivery, and and you have this concept of multiplexing streams. Uh, you don't. Uh, you can have several different streams going on one SCTP association, and an association is kind of like a, the equivalent of a TCP connection. Um, so, you know, of course, you could you might, you might say, well, in TCP, you can have multiple streams. You just open multiple connections. But I think one of the advantages here is uh, when you have one SCTP association with multiple streams, they all exist in the same congestion control realm. Uh, so you don't have to individually wait for packet loss in each one in order to, to back off and, and adjust your, your rate of uh, sending. Uh, so WebRTC, of course, you know, doesn't have to worry about protocol authentication issues because it's not trying to put SCTP on top of IP. It's just putting it into a UDP packet. You send the UDP, UDP packet with SCTP in it, your router just sees a UDP packet with payload, and it says, all right, whatever, this is UDP, I'll send it on, and everything is good. Why do I want to re-implement SCTP? Well, first and foremost, education. Um, you know, I wanted to get more experience with transport protocols. I've implemented many protocols before, you know, HTTP and, and many others, uh, and, but a, really a transport protocol is a lot more challenging, and I wanted to have that experience under my belt. I also wanted to get experience with Rut, the Rust networking tools, Tokyo, Futures, and, and all that good stuff. There is a uh, C-based SCTP library, and it's pretty much the one that everybody uses because no one wants to re-implement SCTP for some reason. Um, and you know, you see that you know, you look in, in Chrome, you look in Firefox, you look in you know the WebRTC reference libraries, you look in other WebRTC libraries, you always find the same. C library, live user SCTP. It's basically the FreeBSD kernel implementation of SCTP where they kind of took it out of the kernel, threw in a bunch of if defs, if def kernel, then do this, if def user space, then do this other thing. Um, I think it's good to have options. I think it's good to have a second opinion. Uh, you could have a second implementation, you know, and who knows, someday it may be more reliable than live user SCTP. Um, you know, you have the, the rust advantages, advantages of, you know, memory safety. You know, in the beginning, will it be more, more reliable? Probably not. There's going to be a lot of work, a lot of testing, a lot of, there's a lot of things that can go wrong that Rust isn't going to save us from. Uh, just to get out of the way, why, why are we not using Quick instead of SCTP? Well, uh, the short answer is we, we may be using Quick in, in WebRTC someday. There are people looking to make, you know, to make that happen. There are people looking to sort of make changes to Quick and our WebRTC to kind of bring the two together. Right now, it looks like uh, Quick would end up being a third option for WebRTC, so you might have the option of media, the data channels, which are based on SCTP, and Quick as a third thing. I don't think it's gonna really replace SCTP for what they're calling data channels right now, but who knows. So, now we get to the good Rust parts. How do we go about implementing an SCTP stack in Rust so that we can support WebRTC data channels? Well, first I decided to set realistic goals, not try to get too fancy with it. Um, you know, for, for the first thing we can do is throw out anything in SCTP that we don't need for WebRTC. And most of that really is the multi-homing. By getting rid of, you know, SCTP has this feature called multi-homing where it can use multiple network interfaces. Uh, and multiple network links, you know, and if you're associated with another peer and one of those network links go, goes down, it can fall back to another one. Uh, it makes SCT rather complex. Uh, you know, every other paragraph in the specification is like, oh, but you have to make sure to think about multi-homing here. And um, so it, it does simplify things a great deal by getting rid of multi-homing. It's useless in, in WebRTC anyway, because WebRTC, um, your SCTP stack does not talk to any sort of network interface. It talks to the DTLS layer, which talks to whatever. Um, I'm going to stick to stable and published tools and crates for now. You know, I, I'm, I'm too scared that if I you know, do anything experimental, if I'm on Rust nightly or, or using Futures 0.2 or 0.3, 
Um, the, you know, I may spend all of my time trying to trying to keep up with the changes in these libraries, uh, the changing APIs, and so on, and not have any time left over to actually implement SCTP. So for the time being, we're going to be very conservative with uh, the dependencies, and then later, you know, kind of uh, bump bump up to the next version of futures, maybe the fancy async await stuff, or and all that. Um, in the beginning, I'm not worried about optimization. If, you know, eventually, of course, we want a high performance stack, but for right now. Uh, just to get the pieces together, I think it's perfectly okay to box, clone, whatever, see that it works, and then later, later we can optimize. Uh, what rusty tools am I using? Uh, I'm using NOM to parse packets. Is that a good idea? You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, we can revisit that at some point here, but... Uh, uh, I would love to have some tool where you could describe a, a packet and it would generate both a parser and a synthesizer because it's kind of a pain to write all this out in NOM to say, here, here parse a, uh, an init chunk. A and then you have to redo all that work to write your own generator to spit out an init chunk. chunk. Uh, but, um, you know, who knows? If anyone has any ideas, I'm open to them. Of course, I use Tokyo like everything else in Rust. It's a uh, good system for doing asynchronous I.O. Um, all, all, you know, like I said, all of, all of these crates are rapidly evolving. Um, the, I'm still using the Tokyo Core API for SCTP, uh, and which is deprecated now. They've moved to using a little bit, little bit different uh, API. Um, I looked at the to upgrading to the newer API, but uh, because they're really trying to push this multi-threaded idea now, your futures have to be thread friendly. Um, there's a lot I think I need to go in and uh, fix up in my futures crate to make them be sendable and, and all that. Uh, futures 0 0.1 uh, is still the latest and greatest published futures crate in spite of all the talk we've been hearing this year about uh, all the new things in futures. Uh, there were briefly some futures 0.2 versions published and then quickly yanked to much drama. Um, there is a race condition in Futures 0 0.1, I, I found. Um, I think they fixed this in later versions of Futures. I'm not sure if that's going to be backported to 0 0.1 or not, but that's something I'm going to have to keep an eye on. Uh, Tokyo Timer, um, I used it when it was 0 0.1. You know, I'm still using 0 0.1. Uh, it unfortunately has, I, I, had, I had no idea at the time, it has such a crummy clock, clock granularity. 100 milliseconds, a tenth of a second. Uh, is not really suitable for network protocols. Um, you know, fortunately, uh, 0 0.2 has a one millisecond granularity, so definitely need to upgrade that at some point here. So how do we design an SCTP stack? Um, I think there's really only one obvious way. You have a, you know, pluggable lower layer protocol that, you know, you could say, you know, where your stack can work on anything that can implement, say, a lower layer trait. Uh, right now I have lower layer implementations for UDP and DTLS. The UDP one is useful for testing with the, against the live user SCDP utilities because um, they work with SCTP UDP encapsulation. Uh, the uh, DTLS, I also have a lower layer for that because that is of course required for WebRTC. Uh, upper layer protocols, the, you know, the one we're concerned with is WebRTC data channel. Uh, but you really could, you know, write any application that, you know, uh, to do any sort of protocol on top of SCTP with it, with this library. How do we, how do we do futures? Uh, right now, the way it works is we have this one future that's a SCTP stack. Um, it handle, handles the incoming connections, dispatching to, you know, the right association, and so on. Um, it has child futures. It delegates to uh, the association futures as needed. Uh, which, of course, in turn handle the multiple streams that you can have for each association. All of this runs in one uh, Tokyo task. You know, is this a good idea? I don't, maybe, maybe not. Um, you, we could th theoretically put associations on their own tasks. And with the newer versions of Tokyo, and we support those, that means that the associations could uh, run on different threads. And you can use multiple cores. Um, whether that actually gets you much of benefit or not, you know, given that you're probably doing a lot of other things in your at the application layer um, on different cores, I don't know. But you know, we have options. Uh, so yeah, implementation uh, implementations issues. One of the big sort of uh, conceptual stumbling blocks I've had here 
is that associations have this enormous amount of state in SCTP. It's not just the the SCTP state, whether it's you know established or in cookie and accurate state or whatever. Uh, there's you know clocks that have to be uh, you know maintained. There's queues and and window sizes and and all of this stuff. And you have all these cross cutting concerns uh, like retransmission and congestion control and, and so on. All these all these cross cutting concerns. It's hard to compartmentalize them out into their own component, their own struct, their own future, because uh, they want to touch every other bit of state in the association. Uh, it's, it's really frustrating. I did get some good pointers on how uh, this might could be approached better uh, in the Rust meetup the other night, and I'm looking forward to investigating those. Well, another sort of uh, big challenge is the, uh, the message reassembly. Uh, SCTP is message oriented and not byte oriented like TCP. Uh, you get a discrete message of a you know whatever length. Um, these messages can be ordered or unordered, and you know even within the same stream. Uh, you so we get these message fragments and we have to put them back together into messages, and it's it's quite complicated. In order, to keep things simple, I am trying to just stick with using the standard Rust tools, the Rust collections like Btree Map, Binary Heap, Link Less, like you can see here. Uh, the um, so we have a different path. If, if the message comes in, it says I'm an ordered message. We take one path. If it's unordered, we take a different path. Uh, you know, if it's ordered, we have to uh, say, hey, is this the next fragment that needs to be assembled or, or delivered? Then we can move it on. Otherwise, we have to throw it in this binary heap. And every new message that comes in, we can query the bi binary this min binary min heap and say, what is your lowest you know sequence number? Uh, and if this if it comes right after this one, then we know we can we have the missing piece, and we can make a message and send it on. And, you know, uh, there's probably if we we could probably make our own custom algorithms and implementations to really do this much more efficiently. I'm really not motivated to do this right now because all this is going to have to change. The uh, WebRTC specification does require an SCTP extension that allows for interleaved data. Uh, where fragments of one message can be interleaved with fragments of another message, and I understand why why they do this. Um, you don't want to, you know, if you send a, like a one megabyte message, you don't want it to sort of hog the the, the channel uh, and not let any other smaller messages get through while you're, you know, waiting for this message to, uh, to be delivered. You don't want to have this sort of a, you kind of get back to TCP headline blocking if you can if you can do that. So I understand why they have message uh, inter the interleaved messages, but. Uh, it is going to require e probably even more sophisticated reassembly steps than than what we see here. Memory efficiency. Uh, not too worried about this at this stage. Uh, we will, of course, want memory to be very efficient. Uh, we want to minimize copies as much as possible. Um, interestingly, I I, l I looked at the uh, the Linux um, stacks to see how they manage memories for incoming payloads. And I thought, you know, I, I bet they have something really clever. Linux servers move just terabits and terabits of data every day. You know, this must be really highly optimized. I bet they have some, like, maybe it's an arena or, you know, uh, buffer pools of different sizes. Maybe each a power two bigger than the last or whatever. So I, I looked at the source code. No, nope, no, they just malloc. <laughs> so, you know, if it's good enough for Linux, you know, I'm not too worried about mallocing uh, or heap allocating at, at this stage. Um, I do think that I do think that Linux uh, tends to heap allocate maybe an MTU size, even if you send something much, even if you receive something much smaller, and that, that may help with heap fragmentation. So testing, uh, this is a pretty boring slide. There's a lot of things that you can write unit tests for, of course. You know, um, you know, parsing packets. You, you know, that's a kind of a no-brainer to write tests for our serial number arithmetic, those reassembly queues, the buffer management, all great candidates for unit tests. And there are unit tests in the code for, for these. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the unit tests I use, you uh, rely on random number generators to really test a broad array of uh, scenarios. And like like many others, I always use a seeded deterministic RNG so that those unit test failures can be reproduced and, and hence debug more easily. There's a lot of stuff in SCTP, really the association state machine. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there that we just can't test with unit tests. It relies on having a peer. It relies on the interactions between the, the, the two endpoints. 
So for that, we have simulation testing. Uh, the simulation testing relies on the, the pluggable lower layer system. You know, I, like I mentioned, I have a lower layer for UDP, I have a lower layer for uh, DTLS. There is also a lower layer called a simulation lower layer that does not interact with a real network interface at all. Um, when the SCP stack needs to send a message, the simulation lower layer takes that message and moves it around in memory to some other instance of an SCTB stack. In that way, we can write integration tests in Rust to test things like retransmissions, uh, you know, associations, you know, moving large bits of data back and forth between stacks, you know, and that this comes in really handy. This is what it looks like uh, from a Tokyo standpoint. Um, or the way the way it works right now, anyway, is all of the uh, SCTB stacks I spin up for the simulation are all joined together to one future, and that's one Tokyo task. I do spawn a router future, which sort of simulates the network backplane uh, to move pa packets back and forth between different SCTP stack instances. We have the, uh, there's a pause future. That's kind of interesting. One of the integration tests I needed was a test for simultaneous shutdown. Uh, there's a scenario in SCTP where each endpoint, if they happen to send a shutdown message at the same time, very specific things have to happen um, according to the specification. So how do I test this? How do I get the timing just right between my uh, simulated SCTP stacks? Um, how I did this was I added a feature to pause the simulation. So I set up the association, pause the simulation, inject the shutdown messages, you know, and queue them, and then restart the simulation, and it works to make a sort of a cross shutdown every time. And the test is the test passes, so that looks good. The future, uh, there's a lot of, you know, risks when you, when you think about writing a network stack. You know, if you don't get congestion control just right, you can be a bad network citizen. You can elbow out other people trying to use TCP, uh, and everyone will hate you for it. Even uh, established protocols like QUIC still get a little bit of grease sometimes about uh, their more aggressive congestion control, uh, even though they're implementing their own specification perfectly. So th this is uh, something to think about. Also, uh, uh, transport protocols are uniquely attackable in ways uh, where you can construct these denial of service attacks. If your if your implementation is such that if you could send a certain kind of data and it and it has to do way too much work, then there's your denial of service attack. Just last month, uh, Linux got hit with a de denial of service uh, bug in the TCP implementation uh, and. Uh, it's exactly the sort of thing we have to watch out for when implementing SCTP. Performance concerns right now, unfortunately, because we're using UDP, um, every time we need a datagram, we have to go to the operating system, we have to make a system call, which means we have uh, context switches happening um, you know, it, for each and every datagram. Uh, you receive one datagram you know, uh, at a time, then you have to go back and make another system call, get the next datagram. You send one datagram, then you have to make another system call that's in the next one. Every time you make these system calls, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff has to happen. Um, you, you're switching from user mode to kernel mode. Uh, we have these meltdown mitigations now that really exacerbated doing, you know, all the page table flushing or what have you. Uh, you really want to keep your system calls down to a minimum, and this could be a concern. Uh, interestingly enough, Linux has a solution for this, but it's very Linux specific, and we want to write a cross-platform uh, SCTP stack. Uh, Linux has this receive in message and send in message to receive and send multiple datagrams at once with one system call. Uh, so I guess the question is, do other operating systems have a similar feature? And if so, could we uh, have some support in Mio for, for using that? Mio, by the way, is the uh, network I.O. layer that sits below Tokyo. Uh, that provides the platform independent I.O. layer. It handles interacting with Windows or, you know, ePoll on Linux or KQ on, on um, Mac OS or whatever, what have you. Uh, debugging, like I said, there's a lot of things that Rust is simply not going to save us from. You know, the SCTP is, is a complex protocol. There's a lot of things to get wrong that Rust will happily still compile. So, <laughs> you know, uh, even after getting, you know, something that works, there's going to be an uh, awful lot of uh, testing and developing, you know, developing test suites and finding all of the ways which is not 
working quite right, looking for deadlock scenarios between the SCTB stacks. Uh, so now it's time for a demo. This is a uh, sort of a hello world WebRTC demo. Uh, it's like many others on the web. You know, we'll get to the interesting part in just a bit, but uh, I'll show you how the hello world uh, works. This is uh, a web, you know, a web app I whipped up using Actix, and you know, it keeps a roster of connected clients. And you can see when you say chat, it opens a WebRTC data channel connection between the two browsers. You know, and I can say. Hello, Firefox, or, you know, hello, Chrome. And, and these are and these go back and forth over WebRTC data channels, which are SCTP over DTLS over UDP. Um, the question is, can we connect with Rust? So we'll, um, I do have an example of using WebRTC data channels in pure Rust, except for OpenSSL. This example program uh, uses WebSockets to communicate with the, the web app, and so it can be added to the roster. I implemented just, just barely enough of the other puzzle pieces of WebRTC, uh, such as ICE, STUN, uh, SDP parsing, you know, just enough of that to make this, to make this work. It's, it's not really a, a great example right, <laughs> right now. It's not a, a full implementation of a WebRTC client. But it's just enough to show that we can use the SCTP stack to communicate. So what happens when we try to open a WebRTC data channel to uh, our Rust program? Bam, it works. We get this message, greetings from the magical land of Rust. We can say, hello, Rust. And, and that's that. We can see over here, uh, you see SCTP data packets on the trace log coming and going. Uh, data packets, uh, there's some selective acknowledgement packets. Occasionally you'll see a heartbeat packet, heartbeat and heartbeat echo go back and forth. Um, and so it works. This is very encouraging to see that this, this is, you know, gives me a lot of confidence that using SCTP, uh, or using SCTP and Rust to implement WebRTC data channels is very doable. Um, this is something that, you know, we have to go back and polish an awful lot of rough edges on this, uh, implement things that are not fully Im implemented, but, uh, this is, this is possible. So, and, and of course the, you know, my Rust client spits out these random Rust quips here so that you have something to, to look at. And that's that, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, this is not production ready right now. Hopefully in the future, you know, we can get this SCTP stack production ready, have a good story with the uh, WebRTC data channels, and eventually have a full Rust option for implementing, for using WebRTC. And when that happens, I hope it, you know, it's become so easy uh, for people to use peer-to-peer uh, -peer connections to create network applications that a lot more people decide to dive into it and, and see what they can do. Well, thanks for watching.